This is a video based on requests I've received to do a video series about the book Alan Cottrell and I wrote Towards a New Socialism. This is about the background to the book and broadly covers the introduction that is given in the Czech and German prefaces to the book. A bit of background. The book was published in English in 1992. It had been written a couple of years earlier, but there was a delay in publication because Verso, or New Left Books as they were then called, decided that after the fall of the Soviet Union, books promoting socialism didn't fit in with their marketing strategy. And we eventually managed to get publication by the Bertrand Russell Foundation. Subsequently, versions have appeared in a number of languages. I think roughly the order was Swedish, German, Czech, Finnish, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Esperanto, various other uh, translations are either done or underway. I know of Hungarian and Portuguese translations underway. Uh, someone said they were doing a Bengali one, but I don't know whether it ever came out. Now, the book's marked by the conjunction in which it was written. Uh, it was written during the Gorbachev period, and it was a point at which market socialists were already beginning to disrupt the economy of the USSR, and were giving political encouragement to social groups who wanted a complete restoration of capitalism there. And it's also marked by our experiences of the fight against Thatcherism in Britain and the sections on direct democracy are particularly influenced by our experiences of that. In Britain, the extreme right-wing Thatcher government had been in power for almost 10 years when we wrote the book, or maybe slightly more than 10 years. For a decade, her government had been systematically destroying the social gains that the working class had made under previous social democratic governments during the period from 1945 to the late 1970s. State-owned industry was being privatised. Repressive legislation was being introduced against the trade unions and an attempt was being made to deprive the poor from their right to vote by using the poll tax. It wasn't explicit that they wanted to take away the right to vote, but that was the effect of it. When they taxed being on the electoral register, Obviously, a lot of people withdrew their names from the electoral register, people who could least afford to pay the tax. So this was a, there was a direct attack on democracy at the time. Now, her programme of rolling back socialism, or at least such elements of socialism as social democracy had introduced, and entrenching the power of the rich, was justified by a school of thought that you would now call neoliberalism. They weren't quite calling it that it in those days. It was just called Thatcherism. And its leading theorists were people like Hayek and Friedman, who advocated an unrestrained free market, a minimal state, and minimal social welfare. These are all familiar policies now. Neoliberalism went through three phases. There was a phase before it started to have an effect. Back in the 1940s, when the neoliberal theorists started writing their manifestos, it was out on a limb. It failed to answer the problems of the Great Depression and the dominant form of orthodox economic thought became Keynesianism. So it was a subterranean current 
within orthodox economic thought. And its first real opportunity came with the Pinochet coup against Allende in Chile. This gave the neoliberals their first chance to put into practice what had up until then been highly theoretical doctrines. This is uh, uh, the last image of Allende that was taken before he was killed. He's seen coming out of the presidential palace and looking up and seeing the fighter bombers which are about to bomb the, the palace, sent by General Pinochet, shown to the left here. Pinochet was a great mate of Thatcher's. When he was arrested in Britain on a warrant from a Spanish judge, he was entertained and visited at Thatcher, who by then retired. Now, the second phase was Thatcher. This was the first time neoliberalism got hold of a major capitalist economy. And as in Chile, before you could em em employ that kind of policy, the working class movement had to be suppressed. It wasn't suppressed by tanks in Britain, but it was suppressed by large numbers of police, uh, repressive laws against the trade unions, the use of force against those who demonstrated against them. This is a photo, a famous image from the 1984 miners' strike. Um, that's Leslie Bolton from Women Against Pit Closures, about to be hit by a mounted policeman. Um, there's a lot of rumours went round that, in fact, many of those in police uniform were actually soldiers who were dispatched to to put down the strikes uh, dressed in police uniforms. Again, the third stage and its most triumphant stage was its application in Russia under Yeltsin. And again, it re involved repression. These, there's a background photo here of Yeltsin sending his tanks to shell the, um, the Russian parliament, which was refusing to put through neoliberal legislation. So he, he effectively suppressed the, the elected parliament and established a system of uh, presidential rule, which amounted to uh, a neoliberal oligarchy under which the economy was radically privatized. But it all wasn't just a matter of the use of repression, though that certainly occurred. It was also a theoretical crisis. The triumph of neoliberalism was an ideological and theoretical triumph as well as a military and repressive triumph. And if the left was to recover from this, it required a theoretical response. Thatcher had a, a motto, uh, there is no alternative, abbreviated to TINA. And she meant there is no alternative to neoliberal policy solutions. And the striking thing was that by the end of the 1980s, most left-wing parties, or supposedly left-wing parties, whether it's social democratic parties in Europe, or supposedly communist parties in Eastern Europe, had adopted this maxim. They, they believed that there was no alternative to market-based solutions for running the economy. It was a tremendous change from the situation that had existed, say, 30 years earlier, when, or even 20 years earlier, when it was generally believed that planning was not only viable, but was the way of the future. Certainly in the early 60s, the social democratic movements in Europe, Europe thought they had to move towards planned economies. Now, Lenin wrote that without a revolutionary theory, there could be no revolutionary movement. And we can generalize this to say that without its own economic theory, no social group can constitute itself as a class in the political sense. Now, what do we mean by constituting itself as a class? Well, 172 years ago, on the foundation of the German Communist Party, Marx wrote that the immediate aim of the communists is the same as that of all other proletarian parties. 
the formation of the proletariat into a class. Now you may say, surely it was a class already. But what Marx is saying is, no, it's not a class until it's politically organized. And to politically be organized, you need your own political economy. And the formation of the Russian and German workers as political classes in the late 19th and early 20th century was intimately linked to the revolutionary interpretation of the political economy that is in Marx's capital. But the same thing applies to reactionary classes. The same thing applies to the capitalist class. Without a theory, they cannot constitute themselves and act clearly in their own class interest. By the mid 20th century, things were looking grim for capitalism. They were facing the triumph of Stalinism and the USSR, and right-wing economists feared for the very survival of the capitalist system. And in response, uh, they had a theoretical project. They had a theoretical project to do for capital what Marx had done for labor, to provide it with a coherent political economy that was practically and morally adequate to the needs of the age and their class. The founder of the Italian Communist Party, Amadeo Bordiga, remarks in one of his um, writings from the 1950s that capital was as much a manifesto for communism as a work of economics. Well, Hayek's road to serfdom was a manifesto for the neoliberal counter-revolution. And in the following half century, the ideas of neoliberalism moved from the back shelves of libraries to dominate economic policy around the world. They had a wide impact. We know they were openly adopted by politicians like Thatcher. They were being adopted by figures in the Conservative Party during the 1970s, uh, from the mid-1970s onwards. But they also in exercised influence at one remove within the socialist movement. So you get an intellectual climate in which left-wing theorists lent a sympathetic ears to critique of the economy and to advocates of the market. This was true both in the West and the East. So you've got people like Bruce Cornoy and Abeganyan in um, Poland, Hungary, Russia, advocating models. And in Britain, you have the social democratic um, theorist Nove advocating market socialism. Book of Bruce from the period. So if the original socialism of the 1930s was plan A and plan B was the Thatcherite response to it, we need a plan C. The old communist movement had Marx's economics and Lenin's theory of the state and party as its twin pillars. Neoliberalism has free market theory and the idea of representative government and elections as its pillars. Now, our response in towards a new socialism was to say that the left needs to take corresponding opposing principles. We need the principle of labor value, cybernetic coordination, and direct democracy, as opposed to the neoliberal trinity of prices, markets, and elections. Now, this emphasis on direct democracy comes heavily from our experience, practical experience, of politics in Scotland, 
where we were able to mobilize mass response to Thatcher's poll tax as a clearly undemocratic ma manner, matter, something which had not been voted on by the po pub population of Scotland. The campaign was so successful that we managed to get a very large portion of the population of Glasgow refusing to pay their poll tax, and the system eventually broke down. And we were able to apply the same movement and the same tactics to stopping the privatisation of water in Scotland. And our tactic there, or the tactic of the same campaign, was to call for a, a referendum on the issue. And when the referendum was held, the huge majority were against the privatisation of water. So these were very influential in our view of how to proceed. So what's plan C? We called it towards a new socialism. We called it that because it was impossible to get a book with the title Communism published in 1992. It was hard enough to get a book about socialism. As I say, reject, we were rejected by Verso. We were originally going to call it post-Soviet communism. But the book lays out although we say towards a new socialism, what it really lays out is what Marx termed the first phase of communist society, except it lays it out with the technology of the late 20th century, not the, the technology and ideas of the late 19th century. But if you go and read what Marx says in the critique of the Gotham program, you will see the same principles are being applied consistently through our book. Now this is just an introductory video, I'm not going to get on to much of the substance of it, but it's worth saying how you can get the book. There's a Kindle version available on Amazon. There is the original version printed by the Burton Russell Press and it's still in stock and you can also get that through Amazon or you can get it from the publishers. The publishers are Burton Russell Press. Its publishing imprint is called Spokesman Books. So you, you, can, you can get it from them. But if you don't want to pay for it, um, we're following communist principles and distributing the book under an open source license. So you can get the book in PDF form from Alan Cottrell's website and you're free to translate the book or republish it provided you credit the original authors.